The old apostle was brought down near the end of his life. St. Jerome tells us. He no longer could walk, barely could talk. He was carried down by believers to be a part of their meetings near the end of his life. John would come down, they say, and and he was so old that he could only remember to say one thing about Jesus, something that had been given to him. My little children, love one another. And when the brethren, St. Jerome says, wearied of hearing the same thing so often, they asked why he, John, repeated the same thing, and he replied, because it is the commandment of the Lord And if this one thing be attained, it is enough to love one another. You think about Ephesus and you think about St. Paul, of course, had a very pivotal moment in his ministry was there. But but when we were there a year ago, I uh, I stopped a little hill and I thought about St. John coming there to spend the end of his life. He chose that community filled with believers, was a a very important community in in Roman culture. It was not a large city, but it was not a small village. It was a a small city. It was there that the, the Roman army trained some of its better troops. And because of that, it was also there that many, many Roman soldiers and their families retired. We're still talking about Ephesus, right? Sounds familiar, yeah? And that's where John chose to go in and to speak the words that we have today. Now, believe it or not, they were controversial words from the beginning. There have been scholars through the ages that have have said, why put that in the Bible? It's it's a little too schmaltzy. It's a little too lovey-dovey. Whenever a couple asks me, can you recommend a passage for a wedding, I always go right here. You know, it almost feels like that kind of falling in love kind of love. But John meant something deeper. He meant a kind of love that never gives up. In fact, he uses an interesting word in this passage all about love. He uses the word murder. It's not very romantic, is it? I know, some of you have been married long enough, you've thought of that word yourselves, but but that's not really what John was talking about. Stop nudging your spouses now. What John was saying is that to withhold your love from someone is the same as committing the act of murder. I can't imagine anything more powerful or any stronger way to put it than that. To withhold your love from someone is the same as committing the act of murder. Have you ever done that? Be honest. As I have. When I was a little kid, I had a cousin named Bob, and Bob just made my world awful. Bob could do everything. He was just older than me, and and he reminded me constantly of the things I couldn't do. I was a city boy. He was a farm boy. When I was on the farm, he always made sure I fell off the horse or he put me on the roughest horse in the whole corral. We went to play in the hayloft for the first time. I didn't know anything about haylofts. He pushed me out of the hayloft and broke my collarbone. This is the way Bob was. One day I walked into my mother, and I said to my mother, I hate him. And my mother said, you can't hate him. He's your cousin. I said, I don't care. I hate him, and I will always hate him. She said, you can't hate your cousin. You have to love him. I said, I can't love him because I hate him. And my mother said to me, love him anyway. See, that's what John's saying to us as we finish this series on families Probably you've gone through the series and you've, you've reconciled with every member of your family and everything is going amazingly well in all of your relationships. But in case you have one left out there somewhere in all your relationships that's a little hung up, I'm not going to tell you today any magical techniques or any therapeutic models to follow. I'm just going to simply say to you, think about that person. Think about what they've done that's wronged you. And love them anyway. You see, we don't like to, in the modern church, talk about the blood of Christ. 
right? I mean, that's something we don't, we don't talk about that. We, we, we go on, we talk about sweet things, nice things, business models and, and, and poetry and things. But the truth is, that's what the blood of Christ is about. The blood of Christ flowed down not because we were perfect, but because we weren't. And the blood of Christ pours over us to redeem us, to take away our bent for hating, to wash away that thing we have inside of us that keeps score, to, to, to cleanse us of our deep emotional memory. We know love by this that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for one another, the apostle wrote. It is because the, Christ, the cross is central in Christianity that we are drawn again and again to it because deep down inside we know, don't we, that we are incapable of really loving without the help of God. To allow Christ to enter our hearts and guide the way we love one another is to be changed and transformed. It's to be overwhelmed by the power of the cross and washed clean by the blood of the cross. And there's a thing about the blood. If you pay attention to the story, it seeps down into the ground. Because there are things that must be buried. Just as Christ was laid in the tomb there are things we have to lay in the grave. There are things we have to let go of, things we have to, 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 to allow God to bury, to seal in a tomb which they will never rise again. Unlike all the zombie movies and vampire movies and those kinds of things, th these things, these deep hurts of the heart, Christ on the cross can wash clean never to rise again. The apostle uses another example as he's speaking to young Christians near the end of his life. He says, don't be like Cain. Don't be like Cain who resented his brother for his brother's righteousness. There's this is part of us that, that lives in all of us, this, this Cain side, that, that we get frustrated with the people around us. And when we get frustrated, we do things. Now, we may not go actually go out and throw stones at someone in our family, but we do something very similar. We commit murder by holding back that love. Remember the Cain and Abel story of which he refers, right? Abel brought his best to God, gave his best offering Cain gave what was left over and thought it should be enough. God said, if that's all you want to give, you don't need to give anything, go home. And that made Cain angry and he killed his brother. So often in life, we think that we can get by with, with the leftovers of love. I work a lot, I've got school, I've got this challenge, that challenge, this thing, that thing going on in my life. And God, from the beginning... I said, that's not enough. Just as we place our money in the basket, that's our identity card that identifies us. It's brought up here. It's laid on the altar, which is the hands of God. We have to bring the best of our heart to everything we do and to every relationship in which we are a part. When, when, when the apostle through the power of the Holy Spirit, says, don't be like Cain. He's not really saying, he doesn't expect that you're going to go out and start murdering your family members. What, what he's more concerned with is that you will murder them emotionally and spiritually by only giving them the leftovers. And I, and I know the temptation. I, I've gone through a divorce many years ago. Because all I brought were the leftovers. It's not enough. It's not enough for a husband. It's not enough for a wife. It's not enough for a marriage. It's not enough to raise children or grandchildren. It's not enough of a way to love your parents or grandparents. We are called to love in the power and the spirit of Jesus Christ. A sacrificial love, a total love, a love that gives completely. A love in which we lay down our lives for those around us. Now, it's not easy to do. 
In fact, no one can actually do it on their own. That's why we gather every Sunday and we come here and we walk into this room and we practice it. We say the words of love in prayer and in music and in song. We rehearse it here with the hope and the prayer that through the presence of Jesus Christ who is present in this worship service this moment, that our hearts will be so invaded by love that what we have practiced here in this hour of worship we will go out into the world and do. In our marriage, in our parenting, in our grandparenting, at work, at school, with our friends, and even and especially with the people who come into our world whose names we don't even know. To do this work is to do the work of Christ in the world. You are a minister of Jesus Christ. You are consecrated and set apart for ministry by your baptism. You're just as much a minister as me or any of the ordained pastors in the church. Your location of ministry is different than ours. You minister in your homes, your workplace, your schools, among your friends. God has consecrated you through your baptism to be a minister in those places. And your tool for ministry is love. That is what you're called to share and to give. I think of old John was so weak that he couldn't walk, being carried down to those young Christians. The apostle Paul was in Rome about to be headed. The church looked like it was teetering on the edge of oblivion. And John speaking to them saying, the one thing that matters is to love one another as Christ loved us. I want to bring that home to you in a, and I hope a, a real concrete way. Love is one of those things that it's easy to talk about. It's easy to, to, to just say the words, right? John said from, from the beginning the message was love. It's easy to just put that in, in, in wonderful cards and letters, which we should do. But there comes a time in which you have to enact that love. You have to start doing the things that, that, that make the world different. So I'm going to take you to Africa a minute. When Prudy and I were there at the Methodist Hospital. Abby, where are you? Abby, stand up for just a moment. I asked Abby to stand up, and she volunteered. Turn around and face them a minute. I'm going to tell you a story about a young girl named Ruth. Thank you, Abby. You can be seated. Let's give her a hand. She volunteered to do that. And Ruth is about Abby's age. Okay? So in the middle part of Kenya... It's, it's, it's about 88% Christian. They're very passionate Christians. But when you get up to the northern edge where Kenya runs into Somalia, everything changes. There, Christians are hunted like animals. They're murdered and often carried off into slavery, especially young children, young ladies about Abby's age. And so there was a young family, and they were murdered there, and, and the daughter, Ruth, again about Abby's age, was taken into slavery. Now, we have a friend there named Stanley, and Stanley is one of the many young people that we brought over here from Africa and trained in Oklahoma in our annual conference, Your Giving Supports It, and uh, trained at OCU, and then we send them back to run the Methodist Hospital there, a little bitty hospital, maybe the size of this building uh, that, that serves over a million people. And Stanley's the community director. He's in charge of 10,000 orphans and working in the community to minister to the people in the name of the church. And so Stanley began to ask questions about Ruth, about where she was, about what had happened to her. And he began to track it down. And then he, he raised the money the church did there. And through your offerings, you support that church there. And on one very hot day, Stanley got in a little Toyota pickup truck and he drove out into the middle of the desert of one of the most dangerous places on the face of planet Earth, a place where U.S. military probably wouldn't go. And he met tribesmen there, and he bought Ruth back and brought her home to the hospital to live. He paid $12.50 American for her life. Ruth is the one on the left. $12.50 for her life. 
Because, beloved, we live in a world that places no more value on people's lives, the lives of young people, than $12.50. You'd be hard-pressed to get a decent steak for that. You'd be hard-pressed to get enough pizza to feed a a fairly average-sized family for that amount of money. But the world is saying to the people around you, that's all you're worth. And the people in your family and around you are stranded out in that desert in a kind of emotional and spiritual slavery. And you and I are called to be the people that break through that and redeem them and bring them home. Is it hard? Yes. Love them anyway. Does it it threaten who we are and how comfortable we are? Yes. Love them anyway. Is it a challenge that we have to sometimes let go of old hurt? Yes. Love them anyway. Are there times we have to put aside what's right for us and what's just for us in order to love them? Yes. Love them anyway. In the name of God, love them anyway. This is the word of God in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.